Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Abraham. And I'm Lacey. And this morning, we're going to be singing a song called Behold Him. Our prayer is that as we sing this song, you may dwell on the goodness of our God, regardless of your circumstance. Please join us. He who was before there was light Walked across the pages of time He who made every living thing Behold Him He who heard humanity's cry Left His throne to wake as a child he became like the least of us. Behold, Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb of Roaring Lion. Oh, be still and behold,
Good morning, friends. Welcome to today's online service. My name is Jocelyn, and on behalf of everybody at Thrive, whether you're watching on their homepage or Facebook Live, we're just so happy that you've joined us today. Here at Thrive, we exist to empower all people to thrive in God's family. And one of the ways that we're staying connected is by filling out our connect cards. If you're new, we'd just love to get to know you a little bit better. And um, if you fill out that card, somebody from our staff will reach out and give you a little coffee gift card, which is really cool. And if you consider Thrive Your Home Church and you're looking for different ways to get involved or maybe even join a small group, um, there's different resources on the card as well. So please refer to those. And you can also fill out any prayer requests that you have because we love to pray alongside you guys as well. Um, another way that we stay connected as a family is by answering a question every week before service gets started. So last week, Katie asked us a silly question. So I'm going to challenge you with another silly question. Um, if you were a highlighter, what color highlighter would you be? I would probably be this purple highlighter because purple is my favorite color and every time I see purple I'm reminded of royalty and Jesus so yeah that's my color choice um, I look forward to hearing your answers and chatting with you guys in the chat section of this video have a very blessed Sunday Hey, good morning, Thrive family. Andrew here. It's great to worship together as we continue our Faith That Works series. We're going to be hopping into the end of James chapter 3 and chapter 4 today, talking about humble faith. And I want to begin by asking you, how healthy are your decisions? We all make decisions every day. We make big decisions in life about where am I going to go to school? What kind of career do I want? What relationships am I going to be in? But we also make little decisions every day. Uh, what, am I going to go out to eat? And uh, am I going to return that text or that phone call? What am I going to say in that email? We make decisions all day, every day that affect all parts of our lives. And I just want to ask as we get started today, are your decisions healthy? How do you even know if you're making healthy decisions? Are you happy with the way that your decisions are working out. Today we're gonna to talk about healthy decisions, humble decisions that reflect a mature faith in Jesus, that God actually has wisdom for us on how to make decisions that are effective in our life and in our faith journey. As we get going, I just wanna to begin to reflect on how many decisions we all make all the time. In the chat or in the comments, I just wanna open it up by asking you to share with us What's a recent decision that you went back and forth on? It could be a serious big life decision. It could be a silly decision, but you just couldn't figure it out. What's a decision that you've gone back and forth on recently?
We all make decisions all the time. Some of these decisions have very little consequence on our lives. Whether you choose the tostada or the burrito tonight at dinner, but you're probably gonna be okay either way. Some of the decisions we make in life have bigger consequences. Sometimes they can affect the trajectory of our day or our week or even the rest of our lives. We can end up in different places than we ever imagined. And it's common to wanna to make good decisions, great life decisions, healthy decisions, and to come to God and say, God, what's your will for my life? What kind of decisions do you want me to be making? Sometimes we can even have anxiety saying, God, I, I really hope that I'm doing the right thing here. I really hope that moving to that new city taking that new job, starting that new relationship, pursuing this career. God, I hope that you're in it, that you're gonna bless it. So many times our prayers have to do with our deepest desires and the things that we want out of life. And we're faced at a crossroads and we're saying, God, which way should I go? Will you work it out? Will you make a way? And we face these crossroads, we face these decisions all the time and big things and in little things and they all add up to our lives. We're in the middle of this Faith That Works series where we're talking about how to have a faith in Jesus that's actually worth having, a faith that works in everyday life. As we've been reading through the book of James, it's a letter from the brother of Jesus giving us practical advice on how to live out a life following Jesus. And so we've talked about having enduring faith and genuine faith. We've talked about having a compassionate faith, and an active faith. And today, we're gonna to talk about having a humble faith. And the reason for that is because healthy decisions come from humble desires. The big idea today is that healthy decisions come from humble desires. Read with me in James chapter three, verse 13. He asks, who is wise and understanding among you. Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. James asks, who is wise? You know who the wise person is? It's the person who makes good decisions. They have good deeds that come from humility. A wise person, you know they're wise because they make good decisions and you can see that there's something going on beyond just a random approach to life and decision making. Wisdom is knowledge applied. It's learning and then doing the right thing with what you've learned. It's learning from your own mistakes and it's learning from the mistakes of others. Today, we're gonna to be talking about how to make healthy, wise decisions that come from a humble place of trust in God. And James is gonna help us to evaluate our decision-making. In fact, he's gonna give us a test as we keep reading. He says, verse 14, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peaceable, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. You see, unhealthy decisions are easy to spot because they almost always have one thing in common. Unhealthy decisions are often marked by selfish ambition. You see, when my eyes are so stuck on me and what I need and what I want, I'm incapable of seeing the bigger picture. Have you ever found yourself so focused on an immediate need and immediate gratification that you weren't able to make a healthy decision. I've got an example from my personal life. So during this time of quarantine, my wife and son and I, we've all been at home and Katie and I have been working from home and so we've been taking turns. And one of us will hold ourselves up in the room in the office and lock the door and work on our computer while the other one is out with our son Dax and we'll flip flop and take turns. And 
depending on who's there kind of getting stuff done in the room, at some point it'll start to get towards dinner time. And whoever's out there with Dax will start thinking about dinner. So a couple of weeks ago, I'm working on a project. I'm trying to be super focused. And Katie, trying to be considerate, comes in and says, hey, I'm making some chicken for dinner. What do you want for a side? And I'm like, I don't know, figure it out. I got to work on this. She comes back, well, we have this and this. Which one do you want? I'm like, I, I don't know, figure it out. And so then she comes back again. Hey, I just, I, I, you got to help me out here. What do, what do you want? Pick one. And I, man, I was so frustrated. And I, all I could see in front of me was, I'm trying to focus. You're interrupting. Can you please room, leave the room and figure it out? And so in frustration and anger, I was like, ah, do you not even know what a side dish is? Just figure it out. And I told her to get out of my room. And maybe in your relationships, that doesn't uh, strike you as that bad of a thing to say, or maybe you can't imagine having been married to somebody like me. But to be honest, it hurt her feelings. I, she closed the door and I kept working, but I knew I'd done something wrong by snapping at her. So I come out a little bit later and I can tell she's been kind of wiping away the tears and I'm, and I'm just more mad. I'm like, whatever, it's not that big a deal. And we sit down at dinner and this is the moment it clicked because I looked down and I saw the food that she had so kindly prepared for us. And all I could think was, that's not the side dish I would have picked. And in that moment, I knew that I had been so focused on what was right in front of me, my need for focus, my need for peace and quiet, my need to accomplish something or get something done, that I hadn't been capable of engaging in a healthy decision-making process. That in fact, I had become rude and I had become arrogant and I would become judgmental and I would become easily frustrated. And the silliest part of it all was that if I had listened, I actually would have just gotten the thing for dinner that I actually wanted for dinner. And so my self-centeredness caused me to make a foolish decision that hurt her and hurt myself. And we do this in big ways and in small ways all the time, where we're so caught up on me that we can't make healthy decisions. And what James says here is that it's peacemakers who have a harvest. It's the peacemakers who have fruit from their decisions, who, whose decisions work out and flourish. It's the people who are listening and loving and considerate and not caught up on me, 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 me. It's those people who are capable of making healthy decisions. When my eyes are on me, I make foolish decisions and those decisions have consequences. We're going to talk about some of those consequences. You see, if healthy decisions come from humble desires, the opposite is also true. Unhealthy desires damage our relationships. Chapter 4, verse 1. It says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. James says, what causes fights? What causes tiffs in your relationship and those lashing out and snapbacks and putting people on blast and being frustrated with people and wanting to ice people out? What makes you feel like I can't trust that person? I can't talk to that person. What even causes things like murder and the hate we see around our globe? And he says, it's your desires. It's when you want something so bad that you're willing to sin to get it. Another way to say it is this. We lash out when we have unmet expectations. I want respect, so I'm going to punish you for not respecting me. Or I'll become a workaholic, so I become a person worthy of respect. I want quiet, so I'm going to ice you out to make it possible. Or I'll yell at you for being loud. Or I'll get passive aggressive. I want you to notice me. I want to feel important. I don't want to be lonely. I want to be rich. I want to party. I want freedom to roam. I want to be heard. There's all these desires at work within us. I want to matter. I want to be seen. I want to be safe. I want to have hope. I want to plan for my life. I want to have purpose. And these natural, normal even healthy desires can begin to take control of our lives and they take us places that we never mean to go. 
because we begin to cope and we begin to sacrifice others or hurt others to get the things that we feel like we need. And you know what? I want to say, friend, sometimes we even find this in our prayer life. And we're like, God, will you please give me that job? God, will you please bring that relationship into my life? God, I so desperately need you to change the circumstances surrounding fill in the blank. And we have these prayer requests and we get upset and angry. And we go, God, where are you? Why aren't you meeting this desire? But actually, God loves you enough to sometimes say no to your desires. See, sometimes when we're so fixated on what's right in front of us and that thing we think we need, we don't see the bigger picture. But James says this, you do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. It says, sometimes God sees that we want things that are not good for us. Sometimes he sees that we're stuck in our selfishness. And God, at times, will love you enough to say no to your desires. You see, God knows not only what we want, but why we want what we want. And he knows the beginning from the end, and he wants what's truly good for us. It's a hard question to answer, but it's so important to ask ourselves, why do I want what I want? And the answer that's deeper than that, right, is that oftentimes we want things that take us further than we ever intended to go. So it starts small, but it leads us far. You lie on a resume one time and you think, ah, it's no big deal, but all of a sudden I've got to keep the charade going. You just wanted somebody who would listen, but all of a sudden you're in an inappropriate relationship and you never thought of yourself as somebody who has an affair, but man, how do I go back from this? You uh, want to feel confident and you, you want to have courage. And so you think, oh man, one drink, it, it helps me to be a better version of myself. And all of a sudden I'm drinking every night and all the time and I'm not an alcoholic. I just wanted to be a little bit more courageous. And how did I get here? You think, man, people are so exhausting and sometimes I just, I just need a break and now I've been in my sweatpants for five weeks and I haven't returned any texts and phone calls and I feel lonely but I don't want to get out of bed and how did I get here? Ah, oh, I'm just going to quit this job because it's not the right fit but now there's no dream job on the other side and I feel aimless and again, how did I get here? And so often we have these desires that are reasonable, good, even healthy or godly desires, but they can take us past God's plan for our life. They can take us to places we never wanted to go and they can hurt the relationships we have with the people around us. They can lead to chaos, disorder, and frustration. And it happens when a good desire becomes an ultimate desire, when we let the desire be in charge. I think this is really important to reflect on. Why is it that a good desire can so easily lead to a destructive decision? In the comments and in the chat, we would love to hear your perspective. Why do good desires so easily lead to destructive decisions? We've said so far that healthy decisions come from humble desires, but unhealthy desires lead to damaged relationships. 
I want to talk a little bit more about why unhealthy and unhinged desires break and harm our relationships. And the reason is because unhealthy, out of control desires lead to and they cause arrogant demands of others. We begin to arrogantly demand things in our relationship with God, in our relationship with others, and we even begin to demand things from life and the world itself. And they're things that we think we deserve, expectations we think ought to be met, and we find ourselves disappointed, frustrated, and angry when things don't work out the way we thought they should. Let's keep reading in James 4, starting in verse 4. And James writes, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means being enemies with God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that God jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? This is so interesting. James compares our relationship with God when we're being demanding and chasing after selfish dreams. He compares it to when you're cheating on your spouse. And he says, Sometimes those of us who would consider ourselves Christians, we would say, I I love God. God's important to me. I'm a follower of Jesus. But the way we live our life, it's like God, we're married to him, but I've got a girlfriend or a boyfriend on the side. And so God, I want you to keep serving me and I want you to cook for me and I want you to clean for me and I want you to do nice things for me and I expect you to love me. But God, I don't think that I can really love you back all the time. I have too many lovers. I have too many interests. I have too many passions. And God is just, he's a relationship we have, but he's not a priority for us. And it says here that that God is at times in his relationship with humanity and his relationship with you, he's like a jealous lover. And it's saying here, man, God loves you. He's in love with you. He wants to serve you and take care of you. He wants to hear your needs. He wants to answer your prayer requests. He wants to be there for you and with you. And there are times when you and I, our eyes are so focused on things that we want out of life that we're treating God, not like a God, not like a lover, but like a servant. Somebody who exists to meet our needs as if I'm God, and God is just one of the people meant to worship me. And so he says, we're like a cheating, a fair-having generation at times, where we say, God, you exist to meet my needs, but I'm going to go wherever I want, whenever I want, without any sense of responsibility towards you. But the good news, the great news, is that Jesus genuinely loves you. He is genuinely and fully committed to you. Verse 6, it says, But God gives us more grace. Grace meaning God's unending, undeserved love. He quotes scripture. He says, this is what the scripture said. God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. This is beautiful right here, where the scripture is encouraging us. You don't have to be something or do something to be loved by God. But you've just got to come to a relationship with God on his terms. It says, look, God's not interested in a relationship with somebody who's proud and arrogant and treats God like a whipping boy. But what he is interested in is fully embracing a relationship with you. And what he invites you to, free of charge, without any judgment or harassment, is just to come to him and say, look, this is who I am. This is where I'm at. These are my desires. God, I'm handing them to you. To submit your desires to God and say, God, I'm going to let you be God. I'm going to trust that you're good. I'm going to trust that you're right. I'm going to trust that you're in control. And I'm going to stop trying to be the king. It says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. To the person who's capable of coming to God and saying, God, I've made mistakes. My decisions are sometimes foolish. 
my selfish desires get me into trouble. But God, all I know is that not only do I believe you love me, but God, I honestly just love you. I see your beauty. I see your wonder. I see your power. I'm just ready, God, for you to be God. For that person, God is standing there with open arms saying, I'm here for you. I accept you back. I will support you. It says God gives even more grace. He's ready to meet you where you're at. But the hardest step is to humble ourselves, to come to a place where we stop making demands of God as if he exists to worship us, but to say, God, you know right. You know better. You're in control. The book of Proverbs says it this way. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. When we come to a place where we recognize God's proper role in our lives, his power, and who we are in relationship to God, and we just let God be God, that's when wisdom begins. And it's in that humility and in that dependence on God that we become capable of controlling our desires and making healthy decisions. So selfish desires make arrogant demands of God. But if we humble ourselves before God, he is completely and totally ready to welcome us in and take care of us. We're going to keep reading because we see that this is the key to solve the rest of our problems too. You see, we also make arrogant demands of others. Verse 11 says, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister judges them and speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the only one who is able to save and destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? James writes, When you've been proud and refused to surrender to God's standard, you put yourself as a judge over everyone. And ultimately what's going to happen is the only coping mechanism you'll have left is that when everyone around you fails to meet your expectations and demands, all you can do is judge them for it. Since there's no good news of Jesus to forgive you of your sins and you haven't accepted his love on your behalf, all you have left is to blame others and to say, it's my coworker's fault, it's my wife's fault, it's my husband's fault, it's my mom's fault, it's my child's fault, it's my cousin's fault, it's my landlord's fault, it's because that's all we have. It's the government's fault is to judge and to blame others when our expectations aren't being met. Because ultimately our decisions aren't working out either. And unless we humble ourselves before God, ultimately what we're gonna do is we're gonna place ourselves as judge over other people. And it's possible to spend your whole life going to church and reading the Bible and knowing right and wrong and making lots of seemingly good and righteous decisions, but still holding yourself in an arrogant place as judge over God and judge over the world. Which leads to the last point. We often make arrogant demands of life. He says, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city and spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Oh, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. You see, we get caught so easily in a place where we just think, my plans are supposed to work. My dreams are supposed to happen. My expectations are supposed to be met. And the reality is, is the world and our plans and our dreams never, rarely work out the way that we planned it in advance. And so the invitation here is to come to a place where we say, God, whatever you want. God, there are certain things I'm asking you for. There are certain things that I'm putting out into the world that I hope are good. But God, ultimately, I just need to trust you. God, 
Ultimately, I just need to know that you're in control. Healthy decisions come from humble desires. Think about some of the recent decisions you've made, some of the different dreams you've been focused on. Have you been clutching onto things tightly, angry at anybody who seems to be interfering with your vision of the good life, frustrated with God for not making the world bend to your demands? Or, with humility, have you come to a place where you've said, you know what? I think this is right. I think this is good. God, I want to put this in your hands. A faith that works submits our desires humbly to Jesus and says, God, I want decisions that lead to peace. I want to encourage you to take some time and reflect on your decisions and find out how much of this is about me and how much of this is about humbly finding my place in God's story. What I want you to know is it's not too late. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. When you find the courage to face your decisions, your desires, and the demands you make of the world around you, what you will find is that by bringing those to Jesus, you will find a God with love and open arms. A God who loves you so much that Jesus Christ came to this earth, lived the perfect life that none of us could ever live, and that he died on the cross for the consequences of all the foolish and selfish decisions. And he said, I'll take the hit for it. And he rose from the dead to prove that he could bring a happy ending to every destructive decision, that he had better news that was bigger and more powerful than every foolish desire, and that in him you could count on him to love you more than you could ever even love yourself. Friend, wherever you're at, whatever decisions you've made, whatever desires you're caught up in, there is a God who loves you, who wants to be in relationship with you, who says, come to me as you are, and not, I will not oppose you, but I will lift you up. I want to invite you to, to pray with me and perhaps to say to God for the millionth time or for the first time, God, I'm giving you my desires. I'm letting you be God. Let's pray. Father, we believe that you are good. And we admit that oftentimes we have unrealistic, arrogant assumptions and expectations of you, God. But we also believe that your love is bigger even than our foolish desires and decisions. And so God, we're bringing you our mess, we're bringing you ourselves just as we are, and we wanna say, God, we love you. We're daring to believe that you love us. Will you welcome us today? God, for the people listening right now, God, I pray that you would come near to them. As they draw near to you, would you draw near to them? I ask this in Jesus' name, and God's people said, Amen. Hello everyone, my name is Corey if we haven't met. Thanks so much for joining us this morning and thank you Andrew for that encouraging word. It's so great to be reminded that we can lift our desires up to God and that he will take care of us. Here at Thrive LA, we believe it's important to respond and take action after hearing God's words. This response looks different for different people, but we want to encourage you to take the next steps. Whether that means discussing the desires that you're going to give to God this week with a family member, a loved one, or even your small group. That's a way that they can encourage you and pray for you. 
Another way we can get connected and take those next steps is by filling out a connect card. We'd love for you to write down any prayer requests you might have, any questions. And if you're new and fill out that connect card, we have a free coffee gift card just as a way of saying thank you for joining us this morning. Also today after service at 11 a.m., we have our First Steps webinar. It's a great place to make a friend, learn more about Thrive, ask questions, and find ways to get more connected. We'd love to have you. We also believe that part of responding to worship is to invest our time, talent, and resources into God's mission. If you consider yourself part of the Thrive family, or you care about the work we're doing here to spread the to spread God's love and justice in this community, we'd like to invite you to give financially so that we can multiply these efforts. You can set up a one-time or reoccurring gift online at thrivelachurch.com slash give. Thank you so much to those who give so regularly and sacrificially to this work. In a moment, we'll be taking what we call communion or the Lord's Supper together as a family. It's a little different taking it online, but basically communion is a shared meal where we remember and celebrate the good news of eternal life that we receive through the sacrifice. The bread represents Jesus' body broken for us, and the wine represents his blood poured out for us. You're welcome to celebrate with us today. Just grab some bread or juice or whatever you can find. I'm going to give you a moment right now to fill out your Connect card, give online, and grab communion supplies. Then Jordan will lead us in communion in just a few moments. As we wrap up our service here, I just want to take a moment of communion. And I know we do this every week, and it's a chance that we have to communally come together. And sometimes it can feel like routine or maybe awkward or uncomfortable. And I think this is one of the most beautiful moments of our service. Because the chance that we have to come together and tangibly have this representation of God's love for us. To physically have this reminder of what does it mean to, to be the people of God. To be a community of God, that we get to take communion together. And, and so as we pause this morning and have this time... I just want to remember what Andrew is talking about, about having a humble faith, about what it means to humbly come before God. And as we think about communion, communion is one of the most humble acts that I think that we can do because it's a reminder of who Jesus was and what he did, right? And as Jesus has this final supper and this final meal with his disciples, he says, I want you to take the bread. I want you to take the cup that's in front of you. And when you take that bread, I want you to remember my body that is broken for you. This like ultimate act of humility, Jesus says before them. He says, I'm doing this because I love you. He says, and when you take the cup, remember that it's my blood that is poured out for you. Again, it's this act of humility that Jesus says, that he's posturing himself in such a way that says, I'm giving everything I have so that you can experience life in me. And so as we pause and as we take communion this morning and as you get your bread, as you get your juice, may it be a reminder of God's love. I want you to take that bread and I want you to physically just tear it in half this morning before you take it. To remember this broken body of Jesus, that he humbly gave himself for you because he loves you. And so I want you to take that cup that represents God's blood that is poured out. And as you take this and as you drink of it, would you remember the sacrifice that Jesus has given? It may be a reminder for us to, to say thank you to Jesus. And I also remember what it looks like for us to represent and to live into that image and that example God has given us as we humbly live into that faith. I'm going to pray for us and then give us a brief moment to take communion. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your broken body and your poured out blood, God, for us. As it reminds us what it means to humbly have a faith that declares your name and your greatness and your goodness. So we give you this moment and this time. In Jesus' name, amen. 
take a moment, have communion in the quiet of your own home, and I'll bring us back in a little bit. Hopefully that time was encouraging for you as we get to spend time remembering what it means to humbly live out our faith and accept God's love for us as we go and love others. I just want to say thank you for being with us this morning. It's so good to be together, even just virtually. We're praying you have a great week. Can't wait to see you guys again. Talk to you soon. <music>